So did you come to church today to worship God? Hey, okay, three people. That's good, that's good. Just good to know where we're at. Um, did you come today to church today to have fun? Yes, some of you. That was like the most boring fun I've ever experienced. Uh, it was like, come on, we come to church to celebrate Jesus, amen? amen. We come to celebrate Jesus, amen? We come to gather as His church. We come to lift His name above every other name. And so if church is boring, it's because you're making it boring. <laughs> Don't make church boring, okay? I'm going to preach a message today, and I'm going to get us out on time, I promise you. Um, but I need your help. Could you help me today? I would like us to, to be as loud as possible. I, I give you freedom to stand in the front row. I give you freedom to shout amen, to clap and applaud, okay? You're not applauding me, you're applauding God's word finding its way into your heart. Do you know what soil is the best soil? It's not rocky soil. Have you ever tried to plant like a tree on top of a rock and be like watering it and everything and hoping it'll grow? No, it doesn't work. Why? Because the rock is like, there's the person who's like this. <laughs> Impress me. Do you know what? Do you know where, where seed grows the best? In fertile soil, it's loose, it's aerated, there's water, there's nutrients, and that's someone who's going, come on, amen, I'm ready today. I'm taking notes. My soul's going to be refreshed today. I came to church on a day that's cold and rainy, and God's got a word for me today. I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay, good, 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 good. I'm just giving you freedom to loosen up. Okay? Amen, amen. So we're preaching today. We're starting a series in 1 Peter. And the series that we are preaching to and starting today over the next couple of weeks, we've called it Outsiders. Why we call it Outsiders? Because the letter that Peter is writing is to Outsiders. People on the outside, people ostracized, people who aren't in the inside, they're on the outside, okay? We're preaching, he's, he's writing a letter to people who are suffering, people who are being persecuted, people who are actually in the minority. He's writing to people, he's saying, I want to bring hope and comfort to those who are on the outside. And today, I want to, if you're taking notes, the message I've got for you is remember who you are. Oh my goodness, that's got to get somebody excited, surely. Like, I know who I am. I'm an accountant. No, that's what you do. I want to remind you of who you are. I want to remind you of who you are. I was reading 1 Peter, and I just couldn't get past the first two verses. I know it's a problem, but it just, it couldn't get, I couldn't, couldn't get past it. But I want to remind us who we are today. There was this, uh, Shakespeare wrote in one of his plays, Hamlet, one of his characters said, to thy known, to thy known self be true. And that's a powerful statement. What does it mean? It means be true to yourself. Do things that are right for you. If you and, and that's a good thing to follow if you know who you are and who you are has good, good, good character, right? But if you're not a good, if you're a bad dude or a bad person, to thy known self be true is actually a problem. It's a problem for everybody around you. But to thy known self be true, powerful statement. But you know what I find is that a lot of us don't actually know who we are. We want to go searching for ourselves. We want to go on this enlightenment journey, and we want to discover who we are. You want to discover who you are? Just look in the mirror, and there you are. In fact, C.S. Lewis, he writes that the more you keep trying to find yourself, the less chance you have of actually for finding yourself. He says that if you would just find Jesus, you will find who you are. Because we are actually people wrapped up in the person of Jesus. Who we are is in fact whose we are. We are in Christ. We have been made by Him. We are His. And so if you're a Christian today, you have an identity. You, we can know who we are with confidence. Can I get another microphone?
Here we go. Amen. That's better. Is that better? Yeah, I feel like it's better. Don't judge the sun, guys. They're doing their best. We love them. I'm not derailed at all because things just work perfectly in my world. Did anybody else notice that the center aisle is not 100% centered? Is it just me? It's just me. Okay. Keep me sharp. Yeah, yeah, keep me sharp. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace. God, I pray that today you would remind us who we are. I pray, Father, for a revelation to drop in our souls and in our hearts today, God. I pray, Lord, that we would discover who we are. We would find our true identity this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that that revelation would change our lives today, God, that we don't have to go on a journey to discover it, but God, in you, we have everything that we need for security in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is, th- this is thought that um, when you have a certain view of who you are, that's actually how you act. That's why to thine known self be true is an important and powerful statement, but it's one that we have to make sure is rooted in the right kinds of things, rooted in Scripture. Because if you think yourself of, of yourself as a healthy person, what do you do? You do the things that healthy people do, am I right? If you think of yourself as an athlete in your 30s, what do you do? You live like an athlete in your 30s. You work out, you train, you eat well. If you think of yourself as a high-powered business person, what do you do? You do the kinds of things that high-powered business people do. And so if we can get our, our, our believing about who we are right, everything we do flows out of that. In fact, our actions flow from our belief, not just our belief about who God is, but our belief about who we are. Some of us actually need to start accepting who Christ has accepted, at, which is us. Sometimes the hardest person to love is the person in the mirror. And so we need to find out who God says that we are so that we can live from the right position, a position where we can make the right decisions and actions because it's based in truth and not based in a lie. Now, Peter is writing this passage and he says, hey, to the church, to these people. So he's being very specific about who he's writing to. And that's why I want to share it with us, who we are. Who is he writing this to? Because the truth is, sufferings and trials of many kinds will cause you to doubt who you are, will cause you to doubt your value. If you go through enough hardship, you will doubt your position in God. And when you start doing that, you start living out of a bad self-image. You will start making the kinds of decisions that children of God shouldn't be making. We will question ourselves and we will very easily get derailed. That's why I love it how Peter starts this letter. Whenever I read a a New Testament letter, I always skip the introduction in my heart, right? I'm like, okay, cool, let's get to the good stuff. But actually, the good stuff is right here. So I want to read to us in 1 Peter. Verse 1 to 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is just modern-day Turkey, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. He is speaking to a group of people that are scattered throughout modern day Turkey. He's talking to believers and notice what he's doing. He's actually reaffirming who they are. He's reaffirming the gospel. He is reaffirming who he's writing to, and who he's excluding in his letter. It is so important because we don't want to let the trials that we undergo rob us of our identity. Listen, the world is speaking so loud and it's telling the church who it needs to be. The only person who can tell the church who it is and needs to be is Jesus. 
That's where our identity comes from. That's who we are. That's where our security comes from. That's where our stability comes from. And so he's reaffirming this to a people who are undergoing severe oppression and persecution. He's writing this to a, a people who are in the minority, a people who are also enslaved in many aspects in society and levels of society. He's speaking to people who are in that world were celebrated, like the world around them was celebrated for serving multiple gods. The Roman Empire were known as a multi-god people, even the Greeks. But to be a monotheistic belief was very different and it was actually a bit strange. And so they were oppressed for this belief. Now, we might not in this room experience the persecution yet of what the early church experienced, but I think we can all understand what suffering is like. We can all get an idea of what it's like to go through trials. And so today I just want to remind us about who we are. So in the time that remains, I want to give you four, is it four? Five things, five things about who we are. What is, what is Peter saying in this letter to the people? He's saying to God's elect, okay? He pretty much says, who have been chosen. To God's elect who have been chosen. The first point for those who are taking notes is that you have been chosen. You have been chosen. He's talking to God's elect who have been chosen chosen. Do you know what I love about that? You know, when, when, when you are, you can't choose your family, right? Your mom is your mom, your dad's your dad, your kids are your kids. You either won or you didn't win, right? You can't choose that. You, 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 you can choose almost everything else in life, but you can't choose your family. You're stuck with them. You're stuck with all of their, their good traits and their irritable, irritating traits, you're, you're stuck with their perfectionism. You're stuck with their annoying chewing habits. Nothing you can do about that. But you can choose your friends, right? What does it mean when you choose your, sometimes your friends are closer to you than your relatives are because you chose them. There was like you wanted them in your life. What I love about God is that God actually chose us before we were ever born. I love scriptures like in the Psalms where it's, uh, David says, you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a mistake. You were designed. You were purposed by God. And it says that in the foreknowledge of God the Father, you were chosen, which means God's not stuck with you. God wanted you. You and, you and I, we're not a mistake. We are not a mistake. We are elected. We are chosen. We are wanted. Why? Because we are loved. Listen, listen, I know, I know myself. I know who I am. I know my, for, my shortcomings. They are very clear and apparent to me. But even then, God still said, that dude, Swen, his name means youth. He's going to be a young man all of his life. <laughs> I receive that in Jesus' name. But I choose him. In fact, the, the, uh, Paul writes in Romans, he says, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and for me. Which means while we, amen, while we were recklessly far from God, while we were living our own way, while we were running our own life, while we were messing everything up, while we were in rebellion to God, while we were rejecting God in order to live for ourselves and for our sin, while we were kicking God in the teeth, so to speak, he said, I'm gonna die for you because I love you. I wanna save you. I wanna spend eternity with you. I want you to come back to your purpose, which is to know me, to worship me, and to be, be, full, be fulfilled in me. 
I want you to know what it's like to experience peace and joy and comfort. I want you to know what it's like to experience my presence all the time because that is what you've been designed for. That's what you've been destined for. Don't believe the lie that says if you just live for yourself, at the end of the rainbow is a, is a pot of gold. Do you know what at the end of the rainbow is? It's a leprechaun. Like, oh, I'm a little leprechaun. Anyway, bad movie reference. For those who, if you know, you know. But while we were in rebellion to God, he said, I choose you. And he chooses us every day. I love it that the Bible teaches that God is not a man that he should change his mind. He's made his mind up about you. And you have been chosen by God. That's the first thing I want us to know today. He chose us even while we were lost in our sin, even while we keep making mistakes. I think it's powerful when the church adopts children because there are tons of unwanted kids out there. But we're not unwanted, are we? God wants us. It's a powerful choice of love. The second thing that I want us to know when that Peter is saying, hey, this is who we are. This is who I'm writing this whole letter to is this, that we are strangers in the world. We are strangers in the world. He's writing to exiles, some of the, uh, who are scattered, some of the translation says, hey, those who've been exiles, who are strangers in the world. You and I are strangers in the world. You know what, all of us wanna be on the inside. We all wanna be in the mainstream. We all wanna be accepted by the majority. But if you are a believer in Jesus, you will never be accepted by the majority. You will always be a stranger. You will always be on the outside. Jesus said you are in the world, but you are not of the world. If you wanna be on the inside, if you wanna be Mr. Popular, if you want everyone to love you and agree with you, then you cannot Follow Jesus. Maybe it's time we stop trying to be liked by everybody and be on the inner circle of everybody's life and be in agreement with everybody and rather decide that we're going to embrace who we really are, strangers in the world. Because our home is not this. this. This temporary place is not our home. Heaven is our home. We are outsiders. We are different by nature. I remember this, uh, this story, and please, um, I, I ask you to hold on to laughter. But um, not because it's funny, but don't laugh at me is what I'm actually trying to get at. You know when you, when you go to high school, you, you transition from, from primary school, was that grade uh, seven? And then you go to grade eight and it's like you were the king of the place and now you're the baby of the place. Right, so it's an emotional time. You know, you're, you're experiencing things. And I remember this one time, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm Mr. Cool, I've got my oversized blazer on my oversized school uniform because that's how my dad, he's like, well, you're gonna be here for a while, so we'll buy you a blazer for all that time. And so I remember at Tableview High School, for those of you who don't go to this or never been to high school, there's this, outside of one of the, of the big auditorium, there is this hill that you go down. And what happened was all of the grade uh, eights would gather on this hill, I don't know what it was, I can't remember what it was for, but everyone was having their lunch and they were sitting down the stairs like, I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete, I'm nimble footed, I'm like a mountain goat is what I'm thinking. But you see, I didn't anticipate, I so like, the stairs are full, I'm gonna hop, skip and run down this hill because I'm an athlete. Someone just minister, God's ministering to somebody in the front row here. You see, what I didn't anticipate was it was a cold, dewy morning. 
And so what I did, I confidently, now, now, I'm like, I'm, the, I'm like, you gotta set yourself up early. You know, like I watch all these movies and they say, if you go to prison, you dominate, you fight the biggest guy there, you dominate so that people know that. So I'm, I'm, I'm like setting my reputation here. So I leap confidently only to realize that I slipped and rolled from the top of the hill all the way to the bottom of the hill. And then I got up, <laughs> but as fast as I could. Nobody saw that. And from that moment, I just felt like a complete douche. I felt like someone on the outside. And I think we got to come to terms with the fact that we are going to be a little bit different from the world. That what we do seems strange to the world because we're actually called to forgive one another, love one another, serve one another. We are called to be outsiders. We're not supposed to be insiders. And in fact, what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, did you guys enjoy that ministry? In Hebrews chapter 11, in the hall of fame, or hall of faith, it says this about Abraham and Sarah. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents and did, as, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with them of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. It says, even by faith, when Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And further on, it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking forward to a country of their own. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We are looking towards a different country, a better country. One whose architect and builder is God, one that has got all of inheritance for us, the one that is longing deep in our hearts. If we find ourselves searching for something, searching in the world and not finding it, it only means that we are made for a better world. And that's what C.S. Lewis says. The scripture teaches us that when we are people of God, we are different to the people around us, which means we move heaven and earth to stay married to the person we chose. It's not a condemnation for those who have had life happen to them. But if you want to change the world, stay married to your spouse. If you want to change the world, Remain faithful to your promises, to your word. We are outsiders. If you want to live the high life with people in the office or people at the sports club or people at the bridge club and you want to run in two different worlds, I'm sorry, but that does not end well. You cannot be at home in the world and a stranger in the world at the same time. Your feet have to be planted in one kingdom or another. So let's embrace our strangeness. Let's embrace our differentness. Is this all right so far? The third thing is this, that we have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit, which literally means this, we are changed from the inside out. The change happens from the inside out. God changes us from the inside of our lives to the outside, which means our outside world catches up to our internal world, which means if we can get a revelation of who we are today, that we are loved by God, that we have chosen a kingdom, 
the kingdom of light, it means it's an internal decision. It, what happens is our outside choices begin to change over time. It means that our, we make a decision for Christ today, but our addictions might only change in a year's time. It means that, that we are being cleaned from the inside out. Sanctification means we are being made in the image of Christ. We are being conformed into the likeness of Jesus. That He is taking time to change the internal world so that we would look more like Jesus on the outside of our world. It means what would Jesus look like and what would Jesus do if He was on the earth today? That's who we are being changed into the likeness of Jesus, and know that the devil works from the outside in. God works from the inside out. The devil works from the outside in. Given into temptation and sin and being, being dragged off to do things that we know we shouldn't do, but they feel right in the moment, only to regret it later. And what happens is the more we expose our lives to sin, I'm not talking to people who sin, I'm talking that we're those who are sin. If we expose ourselves to that, it eventually makes its way into our heart, doesn't it? And it begins to corrupt our heart. That's why it's called backsliding, because it doesn't happen in a moment. It takes a while to drift away from God. All of a sudden, you just don't have that passion anymore. God wants to work on the inside of you today and change your identity the work of the spirit is he is our helper he has given us a new heart with new desires and he is helping us he's applying the work of redemption he's purifying us and he's setting us apart for works of service he's actually doing something in our life he is actually called the helper the advocate the paracletos the one who comes alongside to help us to help us when we're going through trial to help us when we're going through suffering to help us to become more like Jesus to help us to make the right kinds of decisions in life like have you ever had to make a decision and you felt like you should make that decision but this one feels better that's the Holy Spirit saying hey 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 take this road not that road. He's not loud. He doesn't go, no! That's what we do from stage. We go, no! The Holy Spirit, I find, he just does this. He's like, mm -mm. <laughs> God, speak to me. What should I do? Should I do this? Mm -mm. <laughs> God, should I give a million rand to the church? Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry, dollars. What was I thinking? <laughs> God, should I go apologize to my spouse? Mm -hmm. But it was her fault. Mm -hmm. So I, sh I should still be the one to apologize? Mm -hmm. God, could you just give me a sign from heaven? Could you just put a banner in the sky? And God brings these people along your path. And they speak to you, and the Holy Spirit's going, mm hmm. But you're going, mm hmm. <laughs> but He is sanctifying us to be more like Jesus, isn't He? In our choices, we are sanctified for the purpose of obeying Christ. And we are sanctified that our lives mean much for the kingdom of God. You know, the Holy Spirit comes into your life not so that you can experience goosebumps in worship. He comes so that we may be a witness for Christ. A bit of hurry. Last two things. He says to be obedient to Christ, which means he says, hey, if you're going to be obedient to Christ, then you actually have to make Christ the leader of your life, which means he gets to tell you what to do, and we just go, okay, which means it doesn't matter what the question is, it's just yes. He says jump, we say how high? So he says, the purpose of all this is that we may be obedient to Christ. We are the people who are obedient to Christ. We are not the people that mark Christian on our census forms. We are the people who say yes and amen to the will of God in our lives. To be obedient to Christ, which makes us followers of Jesus. 
in Ephesians 5 verse 1, Paul says it this way. He says, be imitators of God. That's a high standard. But we are the people who imitate God in our life because we are being made into the likeness of Christ. Obedience is a blessing. It's not a curse. We think God wants to take things away from our life. Yes, He does. All the sin, shame, and guilt. And what He wants to give us is reward in heaven and fullness of life. But that is journeyed through the door of obedience. Can you be a Christian and not be obedient to God? No. Obedience is the thing. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you obey me, You love me. Pretty much if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now that is a high standard, am I right? Wow. So we are followers of Jesus. The last one is this, and our band can come up, is that we are forgiven. He ends it off, says, we are sprinkled by his blood. Now, if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're a, you know, 21st century kind of person, that freaks you out a little bit. Because blood is messy, it's icky, it's, you know, unless you like your steak really like, like there's still a bit of a moo if you push it hard. But blood is a powerful symbol in Scripture. Blood had this dedication to it. Blood had this devotion to it. Blood had this purification to it. When they would sprinkle the altar with blood, they would set it apart for God. They would, it would be the sign of its being cleansed. There was no spot or blemish in Christ But Christ's blood was shed on a cross. Why? Because he was using his perfection to wash us of our, off our, uh, wash off our imperfection. It was his blood that cleansed us. That's why when we would take communion, blood is the, the new covenant. In fact, Jesus shed his blood so that we could have a better covenant. The old covenant, the old testament was you need to perform. You need to be good. You need to be righteous. You need to get all your ducks in a row. You need to be perfect. You need to do all the works of the law so that you could be right. And do you know how many people qualified to be right? None. So Jesus came to give a better covenant. One that where we've done everything right or wrong, we're still separated from God. But he said, I love you, I've chosen you, I want you. And the only way that we're gonna get in relationship is if I purify you and make you right. And therefore, I need to shed my perfect blood as a forgiveness of your sin. I love that because you know what? I mess up every single day. On the way to church today, I fought with my wife. And yes, God has forgiven her. It's like, Swain, pick your moments. But you know what? I'm constantly sinning against God. I constantly fall short of His glorious standard. And so when I am for, realize that I am forgiven, do you know what that makes me feel? It makes me feel grateful. It makes me feel like, like there's nothing I can do to wreck what God's got for my life. That He's holding on to me. That He's willing to forgive me. He's willing to forgive the inexcusable in me. He's willing to bridge the gap that I can't do on my own. And He wants to do that for you as well. You all fall short. But there's a grace gap that He has filled with His blood because He's washed you and cleansed you and made you right. 
And I'm here today to remind you who you are and to remind you whose you are. You are not lost and abandoned. You are not an orphan. You are a child of the Most High God. You are loved and prized by majesty. All of heaven is watching over your life, willing you and wishing you to walk in the truth of who you are, that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God, called, chosen, forgiven, set apart, set free, being changed from the inside out. You are His. So to all the outsiders who are in the kingdom of God, Peter says, this is who you are. You are chosen by God, strangers in this world, sanctified by His Spirit, followers of Jesus, and forgiven. So why today would we have any other view of ourselves? You are not labeled by your mistake. You are labeled by Jesus. And you are amazing in His eyes. And today I wanna invite you to be amazing in your own eyes. Not in the beautiful thing, oh, no. But to realize how loved you are. And can I give us homework this week, is that okay? I do this very rarely. Monday through Friday, can you just think and focus on one of those five things? Monday, I am chosen by God. Tuesday, I am a stranger in this world. I make different decisions. Wednesday, I am sanctified by by the Holy Spirit. I am set apart. Thursday, You guys are amazing, obedient to Christ. And Friday, you are forgiven. I am forgiven. I wanna pray for us today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and mercy, my God. All of heaven is in worship with you. And all of creation dies to cry out to you. Father, I pray today that you would do a deep work in us to change our self-image. That Father, if we are to resist temptation, be strengthened through trial and suffering, it's gonna take us to know who we are and whose we are. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do a deep work in each of us today, that we would walk out different that we would walk out knowing who we are and that we may follow you, Jesus.